theme of this uh, conference this weekend. I do have a couple of just uh, brief announcements to make before we get started. I do want to say hi to my dear sweet wife. She was not able to be out here with, uh, with me this year. And we want to say hi from the folks in San Juan Capistrano, the ministry out there. Several of you I, have been out there over the last few years, so it's really good to, to see you again. And we do want to invite you to come on out. We have a conference in February each year. Brother Jordan has been out there, I think, what, like 33 years we've had that conference, something like that. So I've had him out there and uh, really enjoy the opportunity to fellowship around the Word of God out there. What I wanted to mention, you know that Lori is, um, she writes a lot. She writes all my notes, by the way. You, you guys know that, right? <laughs> anyway, she had put together a poem uh, using the letters of the English language, A, B, C, D, help me. Some of y'all got it, right? <laughs> anyway, she put together a poem, and I just want to read some of this and then tell you why I'm mentioning this. This, this is just kind of the first part of it. It says, accepted in the beloved, wherein dwelleth God's love, Blessed with all spiritual blessings in heaven above. Crucified, buried, and raised with him, delivered from the power of sin, and, and so on. So each of the letters conveys a different doctrine found in Paul's epistles. So what she did is she took each of those phrases in the poem and made like a one-page study out of that part of the poem. Are you familiar with the daily bread, that kind of a concept? Well, what this does is that each day you can read a part of the poem and, and the doctrine associated with it. And um, so there's 26 letters, if I counted right, in English language, right? Anyway, so the title of that little booklet right there, it's called Complete in Him. It is available. And what we have found is that if you want to introduce someone maybe who is a believer, but maybe they don't know much about right division and maybe they're not even initially so excited about it, but sometimes they're willing to sit and talk further about what it means to be complete in Christ, and that's what this little booklet does, and so there's a sense in which it maybe kind, kind of open the door. If you can get someone to sit down and, and go through these things with you from the verses about what it, really, what it means to be complete in him, then, then almost by default, you're teaching them the grace message because of how much time you're going to be spending in Paul's epistles when you do that. And little by little, when, when you're doing that, you'll find that, uh, that that door will open up a little bit and a little bit more to where they'll begin to ask maybe different questions than they asked before, such as if you really are complete in Christ and you say, well, the Holy Spirit of pro promise, then how do you deal with Matthew 24 where Christ says, he that shall endure unto the end shall be saved? So... Do you have to endure to be saved, or are you already complete in Christ? So see how those types of things can come up. So anyway, um, I would commend that to you, and I think they have some on the back table there. We're actually going to be going through this book with the teens class this week so that they themselves, first of all, can know for sure that they are complete in Christ and, and all those things, but then also hopefully be equipped to share the things with, with, uh, with their teenager friends when they get back to school. Um, Okay, now having said that, we're going to begin, we're going to start tonight here in the book of uh, Philippians, and we're going to go to chapter number two here, Philippians chapter number two. The verse tonight, and really the theme of this conference, it's based out of, I'm going to go all the way back to verse 12, but it's actually down in verse 16. He says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye now notice, shine as lights in the world. And here's our phrase, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Let's unite our hearts in a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we do ask that as we begin the conference now this, this, uh, this evening, as we open your word, might you impress upon our hearts 
that this is your word. These are your very words. And that what we are doing here this week, gathering around your word, is something very, very different than what, sad to say, much of Christianity even thinks when they approach your word. But God, we, we ask that, that we would see what you see and say about your word so that when we read it and memorize it and take it into our soul and then share it with others, that we would see that that is holding forth the word of life. And we'll thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Let me begin tonight by saying a couple of things. First of all, that what someone believes about the Bible, how we approach the Bible, will absolutely determine what we get out of the Bible. Let me, let me say that again a different way. If we believe that the Bible is kind of the Word of God, that it is better than other religious books out there, that it is, it does kind of tell us the story of what's really going on in the world, well then, that's about what we're going to get out of the Bible at best. But on the other hand, if we believe that the Bible, and in my message tonight, and I, I think I'm confident I can say about all the men that are going to be speaking this week, I, I'm holding the King James Bible is what I'm holding. I'm holding the King James Bible. And so with everything I'm telling you tonight, I'm, I'm saying it, I, that I'm teaching out of a King James Bible. And the things that, I, that I'm going to show you tonight, as well as all the men they're teaching, they're going to be showing you verses in the English language out of a King James Bible. And so we're going to be making some claims about this book. But not claims that are our opinion. Claims that we're just going to read the verses. So back to my point that if, if we approach the Bible believing that the Bible... What, what Bible? Okay, so we're, we're on the same page on that. As far as what I, what I'm, where I'm coming from, okay? And, and I recognize that not everyone here is of that conviction. I, I totally get that. And I recognize that not everyone listening to these messages over the week on the Internet is of that same conviction. I, I, I totally get that. And it's all right. That's, that's, it's a hard issue. It's something that you've you got to deal with from Scripture. But when I'm talking about the Bible, I'm talking about a King James Bible, if we approach the Bible with the belief that the words, the very words on the page that we are reading, that those are the very words of God that were already settled in heaven before it ever got put down on paper on the earth, That those words are the very words that came out of the mouth of God and then got written down on paper. If, if we believe that, if, if that's the approach that we come to the Bible with, then isn't that going to impact what we get out of the Bible when we read it, when we, when we study it, when we think about it? Why is that so, by the way? Why is that so? Well... Remember, if, if we approach the Bible thinking it's, well, it's kind of the Word of God, it's been somewhat preserved, but, you know, it's not perfect, it's not infallible, it's not errant, it's still better than other things, but it's just, just well, then, that, see, that's a very low view of Scripture. And what I have to do, therefore, is I have to take and superimpose my thinking upon Scripture, basically, to make Scripture line up with my thinking, with my education, with whatever school I went to, kind of a concept. On the other hand, if we believe that the Bible, the very words on the page, are the very words of God, then we're not going to, at least, well, maybe I shouldn't say not, because we all still have the flesh, right? But, but, 
the overall approach to the scripture isn't going to be from a standpoint of trying to change it when, when we disagree with it or it disagrees with us. The approach will be, Lord, you're saying something right here. I, I don't understand why you say it that way. I wish you would have said it this way, but you didn't say it this way. You said it that way. So, Lord, help me to change my thinking to match what you say. And that will absolutely impact what we get out of it. Now, sometimes people say, well, then you're just coming to the Bible with the preconceived concept. Yes. Everyone does. I don't care what your school of thought is. I don't care what your theology is. Everyone comes to the Bible with a preconceived idea. But nothing that any man can say about the Bible is near as important or impactful or powerful or as meaningful as what the Bible says about itself. And that's how I want to start conference this weekend. This, this week. <laughs> We're going to take and look at some things of what the Bible says about itself. My, my, the purpose of my message tonight is to, to, to focus on the life-giving qualities and nature of the Word of God and to show the necessity of rightly dividing the Word of Truth in order to get the life out of the Word of God. That's my purpose tonight. And the challenge that I have, which is the challenge that all the preachers are going to have, is we have way too many verses, right? <laughs> And too little time. Kind of a, so we're just going to try to dive right into this and just get what we can and, and, and just kind of go from there. Now, the reason I'm starting here in the book of Philippians is, first of all, that's where the passage is. But I want to give you some real quick background about what's going on here. The Philippians themselves, if you will go back to chapter 1, what's this? Quickly, just notice this. He says, verse 27, he says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by what? Okay, so what immediately do you know about the situation, the predicament that the Philippians were in? They were going through absolute satanic opposition to what they were believing. And what they were teaching. All right? Do we need to fix that? Or is it okay? Okay. I can keep going though, right? Okay. The Philippians found themselves right in the midst of satanic opposition. And you can see the, the objective at verse, look at verse 28. It says, and nothing terrified by your adversaries. What is it that the adversaries were seeking to do based upon that phrase right there? That, that's right. They were the terrorists of their day. They were seeking to terrify the Philippians into silence, inactivity, abandoning what they had learned from the Apostle Paul. The Philippians had heard Paul over in Rome that he himself was in persecution. And when they looked at their particular situation that they found themselves in, it looked like the whole thing was falling apart. They believed, they thought, at least they were entertaining the idea that the Apostle Paul over in Rome was just overwhelmed and he was going to fail kind of a thing. But he says this in chapter number one. And really to, to say fail, that, that's not the right way to say it. But they were quite concerned about how he was doing in Rome in bonds there. Look over to verse 12 of chapter one. He says, but I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened to me have fallen out rather unto what? Think about it. You see, you see the sense of the phrase there? When he says the things that happened to me have fallen rather to the furtherance of the gospel, that tells you that what the Philippians were beginning to think is that, that the things that happened to Paul resulted in the shutting down of the gospel. So he writes this book to tell them the exact opposite happened compared to what the adversary wanted to have happen. So in the first part of chapter number one, the apostle Paul explains to the Philippians how he... Go back to verse 27. See how he says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. See that phrase there? Up to that point in Philippians chapter number one, the apostle Paul just got through showing them how he let his conversation become the gospel of Christ. How he, in the midst of darkness, shined the light of the word of God and helped forth the word of life in his situation in Rome. 
And now he writes the book to teach them how to do the same thing. And to let them just keep, keep pressing on to do the same thing. Right? So if you'll go back to chapter number 2 then. Go back to chapter number 2. When he says at verse, uh, 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 I'm gonna, for time's sake, I'm going to jump ahead to verse 15. He says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse, what's the next word there? Have you ever wondered, well, what nation is that? There's a lot of debate about that. What nation is that? Is that the nation of Israel? Or is that Rome? Well, let me ask it a different way. Which nation is crooked and perverse, Israel or Rome? Both. That's what, exactly, that's the point. Whether it was Paul in Rome, or whether it was the Philippians, who they were part of the Roman Empire, basically, and there's plenty of unsaved Jews around. doesn't matter which one you want to say it is. The problem is the same. That is, we live in the present evil world where Satan is the god of this world where the rulers, whose job it is to maintain the darkness of this world, were doing that very thing in Rome, at, at Philippi, and so forth, all over the world. And so in that setting, the Apostle Paul tells the Philippians, he says, you guys shine as lights in the world of darkness and death. What does a world that's in darkness and death need? It needs light and life. You see how he just said that there? See right at the end of verse 15? He says, you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of what? Why hold forth the word of life? It's because that's what the word of God is, and that's what the world needs. One of the most important things to grasp out of that and appreciate about that. Is that, okay. You know Oh, I see. It, it, it actually, hold on. It completely fell off there. Hold on. Hold on. Watch me pull a, rabbit out, a mic out of my shirt. <laughs> anyway, listen. What, what, what a, a, a world that's uh, dead and in darkness needs is, is the light of the Word of God and the life of the Word of God. And something that's so important to, uh, to remember about that is, therefore, it's not about us. Right? We're not trying to point people to us, to me, to you. Right? We're not the example, and we're not the pattern. You just hold forth the word of God, which is the word of life, which is where the light is. Point them to Scripture. Point them to the word of God. Now, let's do this. Let, let's go over it. Well, I should apologize for all the mic issues. It's my bad the way I set that thing up. Anyway, go with me, if you would, to 2 Timothy 3. Go to 2 Timothy 3. What we're going to do is this. We're going to take a few minutes to see, to look at some things that, that uh, where the Bible tells us that the word that the Scripture came from. And then having seen that, hopefully we'll understand why the Bible claims to be the word of life. And the nat- what that means to... It is life and liveth and abideth forever, what that means. Look, look with me over to Second Timothy chapter number 3. Look at verse 15. You, you know these verses. He says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And here it is. All scripture is given by... Now, what's the next word there? Inspiration of God. Inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let's talk for a few few minutes about this issue of inspiration. What is inspiration? Well, the, the common view of inspiration is that like, for example, someone will paint a nice painting and they'll say, oh, man, they were inspired to paint that painting, right? Or they, they tell a great story. So they say, wow, that guy was inspired to tell a great story. The common view of inspiration is something that happens to a person. 
and then, and then something comes out of the person kind of a thing, whether a painting or a story or that type of thing. That verse says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Let me have you go to the book of Genesis, chapter number two here. Look at this. Inspiration is really is a reference to the breath of God. God breathed. Can you think of the first time in the Bible where you see God breathe? It says God breathed. Where was that? Look at this. Look at Genesis two. Genesis two, seven. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and watch it is, and breathed into his nostrils the what? Get that. Why was the breath of life breathed into Adam's nostrils? Why was the breath of life breathed into Adam's nostrils? No. The reason why the breath of life was breathed in Adam's nostrils is because that's what came out of God's mouth. Y'all were thinking of the end result. I'm, I'm saying, look, let me ask it a different way. When you shake up a Coke bottle, what comes out of it? Why does Coke come out of it? Because that's what's in it. That verse says, God breathed into his nostrils the what? So what came out of God? The breath of life. That's a clue. That's a big clue. That when you're looking for something to come out of God's mouth, what's it going to be? It's going to be life. It's going to be the breath of life. That's why he became a living soul. Here you had just dead. God was playing in the dirt. By the way, next time, parents, you see your kids playing in the dirt, don't, don't get upset at them. God, they're just following God, right? <laughs> He, he's just a dead guy in the dirt there. Just, just no life at all. Just dirt. And God breathes. Christ says about the Father, in his, it, it, he has life in himself. And he bent over and he breathed into his nostrils what was in him. And what came out of him was the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So if God is going to talk... If God's going to say something, what's going to be the nature of what comes out of his mouth? Life or death? Absolutely. Well, you know, you can let go of Genesis there and go to Matthew chapter number 4 and verse 4. You know this verse. Look at Matthew chapter number 4 and verse 4. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. You know this passage. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth, what? Out of the mouth of God. Question, what comes out of the mouth of God? Words. Words of what? Life. So if God is going to say words, what's going to be the nature of those words? They're going to be the nature of God. They're going to be life. Look with me to Proverbs chapter 6. Up to Proverbs 2, I'm sorry. Look over to Proverbs chapter number 2 and Proverbs chapter number uh, 22. Proverbs chapter number 2. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. So you see the connection with the words that came out of the mouth of God and life. Man shall not live. Look over to Proverbs chapter number 2. Watch verse 6. By the way, what's the book of Proverbs about? Wisdom. What else? Knowledge. What else? Understanding. Right? So what's this verse? Proverbs 2, 6. For the Lord giveth what? It, next phrase. Out of his mouth cometh what and what? You've got wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Where did they come from? They came out of God's mouth. When God opens his mouth, <laughs> that's a weird way to say it, isn't it? When God opens his mouth, what comes out? Words, the words of life. 
When that verse says, it says, For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Let me say it this way. Let's say the book of Proverbs was written specifically to us and about us, which it is not. But let's say it was. Let's say we were Israel. We needed the instruction and the information in the book of Proverbs to get through the tribulation period and so forth. And so, we're, so let's say we're the believing remnant and we're reading that verse. And that verse says, you know, it says, wait, the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So if we were Israel... And we're going through a tribulation period. We read that verse. What would we do? Assuming we believed it. What would we do? If, if we needed wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, what would we do? We would open his word. We look at the verses. We'd follow what the verses said. Look over to chapter 22. Look over to chapter 22. Look at what he says to them. Look at the words that came out of his mouth. He says at, at Proverbs 22 and verse uh, 20. 22 and verse 20 says this. Have not I written to thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge? Where do you find the counsels and knowledge of God that are excellent, that excel. Where do you find them? Evidently in a written form. That verse has, have not I written unto thee. Look at the next verse. That I might make thee know the what? The certainty of the words of truth that thou mayest Answer the words of, what's it say there? Truth to them that send unto thee. Do, do you know any book on the face of the planet that would qualify for such a statement as that? They, they, they are the words of truth. And in those words of truth, they provide certainty. And they were the counsels and wisdom of the Almighty that He wrote down. You know, you, know, you, know, you know any book that would fit that description? Yes, the Bible, the Word of God. That, these are the types of things that the Bible claims for itself. There's no other book on the face of the planet that claims these things for, himself, for itself. You know what 1 Timothy 4.10 says? It's, it's an open book test, by the way. Okay, let's <laughs> go Look over to 1 Timothy 4.10. 1 Timothy 4.10 says this, For therefore we both labor and suffer re reproach because we trust in the what? The what kind of God? God's, God both in Isaiah and in, in, in Psalms and so forth when, when seeking to really have Israel understand the, the the difference between him and the gods. He talks about their idols and he says, you know, they have eyes, and, but they can't see. They've got ears, they, but they can't hear. They've got mouths, but they can't talk. They've got hands and feet, but they can't do anything. And he says, listen, you, you're trying to make that God that, that verse says we trust in the living God. If the living God is going to say words, which he has, what's going to be the nature of those words? They're going to be living. The living God is not going to give dead words. And that verse says, because we trust in the living God. You ever thought, how do you trust in the living God? You ever thought about that? Most people have the concept, well, the way I know, the, the only way I know the living God is if he's intervening in my life and manipulating all my, all my circumstances, making all my kids obey all the time, making my job be good all the time, making my property sell, making my tenants always pay their rent or me always pay my mortgage. But that's the concept of the living God. 
If God's alive, he's got to show himself. And if he doesn't show himself, he's not the living God. That's what people think. That's the concept, right? He's manipulating and changing everything like that. But how do you trust in the living God? How do you do that? You know how you do it? You trust in his words. The only kind of words the living God can speak and has given are living words. So to trust the living God is to trust his living words. And it's when you trust his living words that you're trusting the living God. How do you know that Christ is actually in you? How do you know that? How do you know that? Or is he in you? Is Christ in you? Yes or no? How do you know that? Don't, don't, I, I know the song says this, but it's not the right way to say it. We say, I know he lives because he lives in my heart. <laughs> well, your heart doesn't always feel like he's living in you. Especially if you have heart trouble, right? <laughs> right? How do you know you're in Christ and Christ? How do you know that? Because words on a page in God's book says so. That's how you know it. Regardless of how you feel. As believers, have we ever experienced a time in our life when our feelings are telling us something over here, but the Word of God is telling us this? Anybody ever had that battle? <laughs> right, so I'm not alone in this, right? The way you trust in the living God is by trusting his living words. That's the only kind of words that the living God would give. Look with me to Psalms 45. And on your way, get 2 Samuel 23. Go to Psalms, go to Psalms 45. Go to Psalms 45. And then also get to 2 Samuel 23. Look at uh, Psalms 45 and 2 Samuel 23. Psalms 45, verse 1. He says this. The psalmist is, is, is speaking for God here. You could just sense God's passion on this. He says, so this is really God speaking about his son. He says, my heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My pen... My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. And then, and then he begins to talk about the king, the Messiah, the, the one he's going to send in glory. But did you catch something right at the end of verse 1? Look at what he says in verse 1. He says, my heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made, touch, which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the What? Of a what? You see what that verse just said? That verse right there demonstrates the, the whole issue of inspiration. What it is. God spoke. Out of his mouth came the breath of life. Living words. And he had a writer with a pen write those words down. He says, my tongue is the pen. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. That's what the Bible claims about how it came to be and what it is. When we are reading Scripture, we are reading the very words of God that came out of the mouth of God that got written down on paper. That's what, we're, that's what the Scripture claims about itself. That, that verse, he says, I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. If we want to hear God, what should we do? He'll speak to us right in his word. 
That's what he claims it is. My tongue is the pen. The way we trust the living God is by trusting what came out of his mouth, the very words of God. David said this in 2 Samuel 23, verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord God spake unto me, and His word was where? In my tongue. You write these verses down real quick, because I, I won't have time for near all these, but write, write down Mark 12, 36. Write down Acts, Mark, Mark 12, 36, Acts 1, 16, and Acts 28, 25. All three of those references, you see that it talks about the Holy Spirit by the mouth of David, finish the verse, spake. Let me give those verses to you again. Mark 12, 36, Acts 1, 16, Acts 28, 25. Think about this. When God told Moses to go talk to Pharaoh, he didn't say it this way. I read this, I read this recently in the book and I thought, I'm going to use that. That's awesome. I like that. But when God told Moses, he didn't say to Moses, Moses, I will be with your mind and your thoughts. He didn't say that. He says, Moses, I'll be with your mouth. Exodus 4.12. Go read that. I'll be with your mouth. So what comes out of your mouth are my words. See, understand this. Inspiration is not this. Inspiration is not that, that a group of men got together and started writing a bunch of things down and prayed really hard and somehow the Spirit of God moved upon what they wrote and it became the Word of God. In, inspiration is not the idea that, that someone got, oh man, I had some hot pizza last night with, with jalapenos and I, I'm ready to write some stuff. And then God came along and, and did something to the finished product. Inspiration was not God coming along and, and fiddling with the intellectual and emotional and, 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 and internal activities of a of human being where that human being wrote something down and then God came along and breathed on what they wrote and it became scripture. That's not what inspiration is. Balaam had a what? Not a little lamb. What did Balaam have? And what did it do? Wait a minute. You had a talking donkey? Man, that'd be a good show. His donkey spoke. Caiaphas was an unbeliever. And he spoke the word of God. See, inspiration is not a reference to the person doing the writing. It's not that person coming along and, and writing what he felt in his heart and was so passionate about and, and then God come along and say, you did a pretty good job, I'll, I'll make it my word. Inspiration wasn't God coming behind the Bible writers and kind of double checking the work and say, yeah, that's good enough, go ahead and send it out. Inspiration is the very words, the breath of life coming out of the mouth of God those words being already settled in heaven before they ever got put on paper on the earth. The original copy never happened. People talk about originals on the earth. The original never was on the earth. The original was out there in heaven. The very words of God written down on paper in time. I got a question for you. Do you think God's words are important to God? So... How much energy or effort, and, and I, I understand God doesn't put energy and effort in it. I understand that. I'm just trying to ask a question here. How important would it be to God to make sure that the words of life that came out of his mouth, that, that he, he, he got written down on paper in time, how important do you think it would be to him to see that those words survive? make it through time? Listen, his very integrity depends upon it. Right? By the way, go with me if you would to Jeremiah 36. Let's do this quickly. Go to Jeremiah chapter 36. 
Jeremiah, God tells Jeremiah to take and write down his words in a book. Jeremiah 36, 2. Jeremiah 36, 2, it says this, Take thee a roll of a book and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee, and so forth. If, if you jump down to verse 4, then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord, which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. As the story continues, jump down to verse 6, Therefore go thou and read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth the words of the Lord. Jump down to verse 8. And Baruch, the son of Neriah, did according to all Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading in the book the words of the Lord. Jump down to verse 10. Then read Baruch in the book the words of Jeremiah. Wait, 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 wait. Are they the words of Jeremiah or are they the words of the Lord? Jump down to verse 11. When Micaiah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of uh, Shaphan, had heard out of the book all the words... Of, wait, wait a minute. He heard out of the book the words of the Lord. So, did you see the process here? God spoke words to Jeremiah. Jeremiah took those exact same words and spoke them to Baruch. Baruch wrote them down. So as Baruch is reading the words, what's the audience hearing? What are they hearing? They're hearing the words of God. Now, you continue the story here, and some people get quite concerned about what he says. They get quite nervous and so forth initially. And they ask Baruch a question. Look at verse 16. It says, Now came to pass, when they had heard all the words, they were afraid, both one and the other, and said unto Baruch, we will surely tell the king all these words. And they asked Baruch, I love he says, tell us, how didst thou write all these words at his mouth? You know, they're, they're, they're kind of concerned about it. And they say, well, well, tell us again, tell us again. How, how did this happen? Watch what he says. Then Baruch answered and said, well, he, he pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth and I wrote them with ink in a book. If you look at the verses on your whole thing that, that, that none of these are about grace and salvation by grace. Well, what do you mean? You know, well, the first one on the list was the Great Commission of Matthew 28. So I said, you ever read that, actually read that verse? That's what we talked about. You know, he says, teaching to observe all things. Well, what do you mean? <laughs> anyway, so, it, listen, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you can go out making disciples all you want. You can go knock on doors, pass out tracts, do whatever you want. But if you don't preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, if you don't teach the lost the gospel of the grace of God, you understand that most of them you're not even getting saved anyway. And those are... You're, you're, you're dooming them to spiritual confusion. Quickly, if you would, look over to 2 Timothy 2 and 2 Peter 3. Look over to 2 Timothy 2 and 2 Timothy 3. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy 2 and 2 Peter 3. Second Timothy 2, you know the, 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 the passage, pardon me. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a work that, work that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing what? You realize, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you by default wind up making the word of truth a lie. You ever thought about that? Because if, if you're going to go out, for example, Matthew 28, the so-called Great Commission, and you're going to say that that's your marching orders, well, then you've got to baptize, you've got to teach them to keep the law. But that isn't 
what's going on in the dispensation of grace. So here you're going out and you're representing the God of the Bible, saying, well, this is what God wants us to do, but it isn't what God wants you to do. So you're actually making the word of truth a lie. You're not doing God's will. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ, he said about the scribes and Pharisees. He says, you compass land and sea to make one proselyte. And when you have made him, you've made him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Whoa, wait a minute now. Listen, if we go out, if you don't preach the word of God, rightly divided. You go out and you preach to people that, that they need to be, he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. You, you preach to them that, that the book of Hebrews is written to and about them, where it says, whose house are we if we hold fast our confidence firm unto the end? You go back and you teach them like James, faith plus works. You, how about if you go teach them that they're one of the seven churches of Revelation specifically allowed to see it because you're neither too hot nor too cold. I'm going to spew you out. They don't even know what that verse is talking about. In that context, God wants them to be hot or cold. Both are good in the context. That's not the standard way that verse is preached. If you don't preach the word of God divided, you can actually totally, completely misrepresent the God of the Bible and make his words of life Words of death. In our context here, look at what he says. I'm going to jump ahead. Look quickly, verse 16. But shun profane and vain Babylonians, for they will increase and the more ungodliness and work, their word will death, eat as death a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Now watch verse 18. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already. Well, but it is. Did I give you the right reference there? Verse 18, 2 Timothy 2, 18 there. The resurrection is past already. So why, so why does that err? Why is it an err to say the resurrection is past already? Man, I, I, I... But isn't the resurrection past already? Christ rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. Right! That's not talking about that resurrection. <laughs> I just wanted to see if y'all were with me, right? <laughs> but listen, that means that there was a future resurrection from the day that Paul wrote that book that hadn't passed, that Paul led Timothy to believe that Timothy should anticipate being a part of, but that these false teachers said it passed already. That verse is talking about they misplaced the rapture. That verse is a reference to wrongly dividing the word of truth. My point is, what does it say right after that phrase? What they do to someone's faith? They overthrow the faith of some. The Bible, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, it's spiritually dangerous for you. It'll overthrow your faith. And then 2 Peter 3. Look over to 2 Peter chapter number 3. Look at this passage. The Apostle Peter is speaking about Paul's written ministry and the information found in Paul's written ministry, which is the reason in Paul's written ministry you find the explanation and reason as to why Peter's program didn't continue there. Look at what Peter says about this in verse 16. As also in all his epistles, speaking the name of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable, what's the next word there? Rest as they do also the other scriptures. Unto what? You see what they do? By not reading, by not believing, by resting Paul's scriptures, they do the same to the other scriptures and vice versa. And that verse says they do it to their own what? Question. Is the Bible, does it claim to be the words of life? Does it claim to be quick and liveth? 
So what does it give, potentially? It gives life. But what happens if we don't approach it God's way? What happens if we don't rightly divide the word of truth? What's, 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 the, what's going to happen? It's going to point at destruction. It's, listen, scriptural, scripture can be dangerous. Do we have any electricians in the crowd? Any electricians? The rest of y'all are too brave, right? <laughs> what, what's the problem with electricity? Is electricity a good thing? Yeah. Oh, man. You can now yeah, All kinds of benefits. Is electricity dangerous? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You just one little thing just wrong. <laughs> Zap, or it'll get you. The word of God is life. It's alive, and it gives life. Back to where we started. The Philippians found themselves in the present evil world that you and I are still in, run by the God of this world who was orchestrating the rulers of the darkness of this world, that the rulers whose job is to maintain the lie program. And in maintaining the darkness, they're also maintaining the death, sin and death, those two kings, those two tyrants. And the Philippians found themselves, just like you and me today, right in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. And by believing God's word, and by letting God's word sustain them in that, and hence working out their salvation in the midst of that. They were shining as lights in the world. And he tells them, just hold forth that word of life. You know what a dark and a dead world needs? Light and life. And we got it in the word of God. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to look into your word this evening. We thank you for the preaching, the teaching, and everything that's going to be going on this week at this conference. All the reinforcement, all the teaching come into your word and from your word to remind us about what your word is, what we have in your word, and then the exhortation to just hold forth your word, the life that this world so desperately needs. And we'll thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen.